Welcome everyone to Two Guys to the Dark Tower Came, a podcast where we discuss the characters, connections, and deeper meanings of Stephen King's magnum opus, The Dark Tower. I'm Jay Russo. And I'm Sean McGurr. You can find more information about the podcast at two guys to the dark tower came.com. You can also email us at two guys dark tower at gmail.com. In this episode, we'll cover parts one through four of Low Men in Yellow Coats, found in Hearts in Atlantis. Let's start the show. We are introduced to Bobby Garfield, an 11 year old boy living with his widowed mother, Elizabeth, in Harwich, Connecticut. An older man, Ted Brodigan, moves into the apartment above the Garfields and befriends Bobby. They discuss books, and Ted hires Bobby to keep an eye out for low men who may be looking for Ted. Bobby and Elizabeth have a tense relationship, but Bobby is forgiving and has good friends, Sully John and Carol. Bobby goes to an outing at a beach and is able to win, inexplicably, at three-card Monty. It may be that some of Ted's psychic powers have rubbed off on Bobby. Some interesting stuff happened here in the first four chapters of this novella that begins Hearts in Atlantis. And as we do, let's talk a little bit about the book when we're discussing it for the first time. Uh, this book was published in September 1999, Jay, and this was about three months after Stephen King had his accident on the road. Yeah, that 1999 is, uh, I would say, an inauspicious year for King. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is. Listed as new fiction on the cover, um, and it consists of two novellas and three short stories. So it's not a full novel, nor is it a short story collection. And it was published in the Dark Tower epic between Dark Tower 4, which came out in 97, and 5 in 2003. So we'll talk a little bit about that later, about how that all fits in with the Dark Tower. Um, Other books that King wrote around the same time, Bag of Bones and Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon immediately precede it. And On Writing, which obviously deals with the accident that happened in the summer of 99, and Dreamcatcher Follow It. And then also in 1999, Jay, was the Storm of the Century screenplay. So that was an original miniseries that King did for ABC that I have never seen, but that also happened in 99. He published it as a screenplay, which was really interesting, and I liked it quite a bit. The screenplay or the... Miniseries or both or either? I liked both because the TV series was pretty true to the screenplay because that's how it was uh, published. And I guess we could probably find some connections to The Dark Tower. Perhaps we'll uh, we'll loop back around to that at some point in the future. But Yeah. I have never read it, nor did I see it. I know King did a lot of work with ABC for a while there. Like a lot of his miniseries was on ABC and then he did a I think I'm right in saying they were all ABC. And he did a show called Golden Years that I think was also on ABC that was a direct, just written for the TV. And there was, what was it called? Kingdom Hospital or something? Yeah, that too. You're right. Yeah. All sorts of stuff. Um, And then in November of 1999, and this was another unique Stephen King thing, he put out a audio book called Blood and Smoke, which consisted of three short stories, 1408, In the Death Room, and Lunch at the Gotham Cafe. Uh, so that was shortly after um, this book came out. And I really like that. I, being the Stephen King fan that I was and am, I listened when King said, these will never appear anywhere else but this audiobook. So I went out and bought the audiobook. Now, I was already a fan of audiobooks, and King himself is also a fan. So I felt that it was a nice confluence there. And I really liked that production. In fact, King reads these stories. So you get to hear the author's voice, which is pretty cool. And if you're not familiar with any of those stories, I highly recommend them. In the Death Room is probably my favorite there. Yeah, that one's a little disturbing too. Yeah. So Hearts in Atlantis itself was adapted into a 2001 movie with Anthony Hopkins and Anton Yelchin in the starring roles. And it is basically an adaptation of this first story, Low Men in Yellow Coats, as well as Mm -hmm. the last story. I think it combines them and... Um, maybe at some point we'll talk about the movie later on, but just wanted to bring that up now. And yep. uh, the first thing you see when you get into this book are three epigraphs. And the first one is from the TV show, The Prisoner. Who are you? The new number two. Who is number one? You are number six. I am not a number. I am a free man. 
Sean and I are both big fans of the Prisoner TV series. If you're not familiar with it, uh, you should check it out. It's a lot of fun. It's pretty quirky, and it's really weird in a very British kind of way. A very but... British, 60s, psychedelic type of way, yes. But if, if, you're, if you don't know what it is, picture James Bond on acid, and you're most of the way there. Yeah. Uh, very good. That, that would be it. Um, the second epigraph is from Lord of the Flies, which is going to be a pretty big theme in this first story. Um, it's brought up in these first chapters, Lord of the Flies. Um, but what I found interesting about the Lord of the Flies piece, Jay, is that uh, I read Lord of the Flies maybe seventh grade. It's been literally years and years and years and years. And I have no recollection about it other than the Simpsons episode that is, <laughs> is a parody of it. Um, but there is a place in the book of Lord of the Flies called Castle Rock, which is where Stephen King was influenced to obviously name his most famous location in his book, Castle Rock. And then Rob Reiner's film company is also called Castle Rock Entertainment as a nod to Stephen King. Yep. Rob Reiner, of course, famously adapted stand by me from stephen king's the body but he also produced a 1990 production of lord of the flies the book so it all comes full circle here i guess is what i'm saying with uh castle rock and lord of the flies yes eventually everything is in castle rock <laughs> yes and part of the stephen king universe yeah and king himself was obviously heavily influenced by lord of the flies he wrote an introduction for a 2011 edition of lord of the flies and um, Lord of the Flies not only shows up in this book, but also in Misery and Cujo. And then finally, the last epigraph is We Blew It from Easy Rider, which I'm guessing will make more sense once we get through the entire book. I have some idea of what I think it might mean, but I think that's probably best saved for later on. Yeah. All right. So that's our overview of the book itself. Let's get into this story, which, Jay, I have to say, uh, I read the first chapter of this story for the first time since 1999 when the book came out. So it's been 20 years and I don't have much recollection of it. I remember liking the book. Mm -hmm. But when I read this first chapter of this first story, um, I was like, this is a near flawless piece of writing. Yeah, this is a really good book, at least if it's fair to separate Low Men in Yellow Coats from the other short stories and novellas in this larger collection. This is a wonderful Stephen King book. As you said, this is a great story. And King is, I think, at the height of his writing powers here. We've seen the quintessential King from the early 80s. And then we saw King kind of circle his addiction problems and kind of go off on weird tangents and maybe not so great books. <laughs> then he kind of put a lot of his problems with addiction behind him and i think he really started to flex his muscles again here and we you can really see it like this is this is superb i, I would say and i and just in terms of how much i like the story beyond the quality of the writing and the craftsmanship here i love it this is one of my favorite stephen king stories i read the book when it first came out like you did i bought the audiobook on cd because way back then things like audible didn't exist and it was like a 20 disc set <laughs> with like a it's like a photo album of just like disc after disc after disc <laughs> and i kept it in my car so anytime i was on a long drive i would throw this in and listen and i think cumulatively over the years i've probably listened to this book um maybe like a dozen times i really like it and the version that i had on cd was narrated by william hurt and he really makes the story shine yep I remember reading this entire book and enjoying it, but again, that was 20 years ago. I have next to no recollection of what I liked about it um, and much of the plot points, so I'm hoping that it stays good and that my recollection matches up, but I've only read the first four chapters, and I'm really into it, and I hope that King sticks the landing and, and, and continues it on because I really love this, the, the beginning here. And I think what I really like about it, Jay, is... What you and I have talked about before about one of the things that King does best, and that's giving you that feeling of nostalgia and being able to write from a perspective of childhood that just seems dead on. Yes. Even though this is an 11 year old boy in 1960, so obviously much older than I am, all of the things that Bobby goes through, it seems like it's something that I could relate to in some way. 
Um, and even if it wasn't exactly how my childhood was, there's enough of that that it made me remember and have feelings of nostalgia for that, even though it was different than my childhood. Yeah. I mean, you and I are of an age that we were basically 20 years behind Bobby um, when we were his age. It would have been about 20 years later. That's what I mean. But in the early 80s, when I'm talking about, our lives weren't much different than Bobby's. You know, like, we were not fully consumed by video games and arcades yet. Those things were still fairly new. The internet didn't exist. Cable TV was in its infancy as well. So our lives were different, certainly, but they weren't dramatically different the way an 11-year-old today might see Bobby's life. Yeah. And to that extent, this story is just full of nostalgic elements. And King does write kids so well, especially this age range. He doesn't really write kids younger than 10-ish. And if he writes for somebody who's like 15 or 18, he basically writes them as adults. But he's got that like 11 to 13-ish age, like down pat. And yep. he's, he's given us so many beautiful examples of that. I mean, there's Jake, of course. There are all the kids in It when they're children. The kids in the body. Right. Stand so by me. every time King comes back to this well of writing a story about kids, about this, about Bobby's age, he always does well. Yep. Yep. And so particularly in at least what I'm getting from this first few chapters of this story is the trouble or not trouble, but what it's like for Bobby to navigate childhood. And so there's a lot going on in his life um, that he either doesn't quite understand or is just on the cusp of understanding. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the in this book is his feelings uh, towards girls and sex, and you know Carol in particular. He's grown up with her and been friends with her, and yet there's this attraction between them. And how does he balance that friendship with that attraction, and ultimately his first kiss on the the Ferris wheel? But even he and Sully John just get these odd feelings, like when they go past the movie theater and see the mm -hmm. the actress with the long legs, or uh, you know, different books at the library, and just know like, hey, something's happening here with, with with these feelings, and it just like he just seems to like King just seems to nail it like right on the head, like just all that confusion. Yeah, and they're they're right at that that kind of tipping point of pre adolescence where they still kind of think adults are weird. I don't get it, <laughs> yeah. but. I'm interested. Yep. You know, they're not fully on board yet, but they're not offended or put off by certain adult things. Yep. The other thing that Bobby and Sully John to to an extent does is they're just trying different things on, like different masks, different possibilities. Um, you know, Sully John's like, hey, I'm gonna be a magician. Like it is just sort of like a passing fancy almost. Like this is the week I've decided I know what I'm doing with my life. I'm gonna be a magician. Yeah. And after Bobby starts reading a while, he's like, oh, books are written by writers. Writers are authors. That's something that somebody does. That's something that I could do. Like, just trying on those ideas and realizing there's a much bigger world that eventually I'm going to be a part of. And how, mm -hmm. do, I, how do I fit into that? Somebody's got to write the stories. Why not me? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, you and I both pulled out some interesting quotes that I think play into this, this idea of navigating childhood. And one, he says, it was ancient history. Hell, he had only been eight. Just sort of pointing back to like, yeah, I've grown so much in the last three years. Like that was an eight-year-old kid. I'm 11. I'm an adult. But he's not, obviously, because the next quote that I pulled was, he was only 11. And there were a bazillion things he didn't know. So like, mm -hmm. there's that just sort of like, I'm a know-it-all, and yet I don't know anything. I mean, from one perspective, it sounds almost ridiculous to be 11 and say, back when I was eight, that was ancient history and I was a little kid. But from another perspective, it's not too far off the mark. The growth and maturing that you do from 8 to 11 is actually quite a lot. So to him, that's, and especially if you're still 11, that's a huge part of your life. Yeah, it's like 30%, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then th there's this great sort of passage when he's getting ready to go to the beach and he's looking at all of his toys and what he's going to bring. And he's like, oh, I've got these Matchbox cars. And damn, I don't have the Tonka trunk that Sully John has. That's a big truck. And he's like, you know what? He was old now, 11, almost too old for stuff like this. There was something sad about that idea. 
but he didn't have to be sad right now, not if he didn't want to. His toy truck days might be fast approaching their end, but that end wouldn't be today. Nope, not today. And it's just sort of like, I I see my kids going through that now, Mm -hmm. where occasionally I'll catch them downstairs playing with their old dolls and toys and just sort of playing along with them, but their heart's not in it. And yet when I say, hey, maybe we can get rid of those toys and give them to your cousin or donate them to Goodwill, like they're not quite right at that point yet where they're willing to make that leap. So, Yeah. Don't take away the whoopee, Sean. (laughs) That's followed not too long after or maybe right before with the line that adulthood is accretive by nature a thing which arrives in ragged stages and uneven overlaps. Mm. So that's just basically King, the narrator, kind of reinforcing this notion that Bobby might be a mature 11-year-old today, tomorrow he might be an immature 11-year-old, and then the next day after that, a mature 11-year-old again. Um, And it's totally normal and totally okay for that to be the case, because it's just fits and starts and trips and drabs. Yep. It's, it's, there's, There's no, like smooth path to being an adult. So the other piece of childhood that King gets at here, and again, I think he does it wonderfully, is how does a child navigate the world and interact with adults? Because it's almost like they're a foreign species. Yeah. He just doesn't, like Bobby just doesn't know how to react. And what is really nice about that is contrasting his interactions with his mom with his interactions with Ted, because his interaction with Ted Brodigan seem very smooth, very, they they strike up a friendship right away that you can tell is very fulfilling for both of them. Mm-hmm. And there's still not quite that, that gap between childhood and adult. And I think part of that is because Ted treats him as an adult, um, whereas his mom is still sort of keeping secrets from him, or if not keeping secrets from him, her motives are so obscure to him as a child that he just doesn't, he can't see through it. Um, And I think that that's a big piece of Bobby's relationship with his mother is that he, you know, he has a father who's died before he even knew him. And his mom has her life and he just can't envision her life or see into it. And so it makes for some awkwardness between the two of them. The question I kept asking myself is, is Bobby's mom fair? Is Elizabeth Garfield a good person who is perhaps misunderstood by her 11-year-old son because he is still a child? Or is she a terrible person who her very wise and generous and forgiving 11-year-old son is willing to see past her flaws and still love her anyway? Um, Or is she just an average adult who's viewed from the skewed perspective of a child? You know, like, is the way she's represented here, which is through Bobby's eyes, fair? Like, is she that bad of a person? Like, we haven't really discovered yet enough about her to know, like, what is actually going on outside of their home? What doesn't Bobby know? And what might make her act the way she does? But from Bobby's perspective, she does a lot of strange things. She's not just strict. She's kind of cruel and vindictive and very strange in her ways of manipulating Bobby in a lot of things that he does or a lot of things that she um, forces upon him, I guess you'd say. What are your thoughts on that? I think I'm a bit more sympathetic to Elizabeth Garfield than you are. Um, King places enough hints throughout the book that we can deduce a little bit of what Elizabeth's life is like. Um, She is obviously very crushed by the fact that her husband died young and left her with a young child to raise. Mm-hmm. And didn't leave her much of anything else. No money, lots of bills. Yep. She works a job which I think reading between the lines, it seems very clear that she is having some sort of affair with the boss. Perhaps unwillingly. Perhaps unwillingly. And even if it's not unwillingly, even if it is somewhat consensual, there is still a power dynamic there that from our perspective nowadays, we can see that there is no way that a boss employee relationship having a sexual affair can be anything other than skewed power dynamics. Yeah. Um, So between all of that and the fact that they don't have much money and they seem to be living moment to moment and you get the sense that perhaps the boss is holding some of that money over her or that's the only way she could get money. And then when we learn at the end of the chapter or the end of this section that she seems to be saving money for some reason that she's keeping from Bobby that Bobby doesn't know about and yet she's stingy with money. 
I took that again sympathetically as she's trying to get out of the situation that she's in and make potentially, at least from my more positive view, trying to make a better life for her and her child um, and get them out of the situation that they're currently in. Bobby is unable to see any of that. From Bobby's perspective, all he sees is my mom works hard and she's making money. How come she can't give me half a rock to go to the to the park and have a good time? Or why can't she buy me the bike that I want? It's easy for me to see past those things. That's just a, a parent being somewhat strict, right? But there are other things about her personality. She seems to be consistently negative. She's she's overly judgmental of everyone around her, and she holds grudges. And she does these things that don't seem to add up to somebody who really has a healthy outlook on life. And that might not be her fault, but the fact is, she's a damaged person in charge of a young child who is still too young to understand that there's damage in this equation. Yeah. And it's affecting his life in a negative way. It might not be Elizabeth's fault that she is the way she is, but the fact that she acts out in the way that she does to her son. I kind of find a little bit harder to sympathize with. Yeah. Yeah. And I can see that. And I have a feeling that there'll probably be more to come on that in this story. It seems mm -hmm. to be bu building up towards something like that. But it's interesting that, you know, this, the whole point of this section that we're talking about is how Bobby interacts with the adults and he still remains somewhat positive. You know, he's able to let her dark cloud blow over him. And, you know, within a half an hour, like kids do, he's on to something else and has forgotten that and is able to to escape that foul mood. And Ted is able to give him another perspective on it when they're talking about the ending of Lord of the Flies. And Bobby says, well, grownups don't need to be rescued. Right. And Ted says, no. And then Bobby's like, no. And then Ted says, never consider it. You know? And so he's trying to get Bobby at least to think through, like, you think that adults are infallible and perfect or don't have problems, but that might not be the case. So at least he's trying to broaden his views on that in some way. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, this is yet another example of how Ted is such a positive influence on Bobby's life, whereas his mother is oftentimes a negative influence on his life. She just has her, her sayings, you know, life isn't fair. And instead of explaining something to him or sharing her feelings about a thing, she just says, that's the way it is, kiddo. Tough <laughs> luck. Right. And then storms out of the room. Whereas Ted says, are you sure about that? Maybe you should think about it. You know, like, like take a moment, really consider it. And I, that's a really positive approach. You know, he's, he's allowing Bobby to discover things, but encouraging him in a direction of discovery. Yes. And it's not condescending. Like he could be like, you know, your mother's had a hard life. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should give her the benefit of the doubt. He's allowing him to come to his own conclusions, which can be hard for adults to do. As opposed yeah. to telling you, you should be thinking this way. He's like leaving the possibility open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Bobby sort of realizes that at, at one point, Elizabeth and Ted exchange a look. And it comes sort of directly after Bobby and Ted have shared some sort of psychic connection. Although Bobby doesn't quite realize it yet. And he says it was telepathy in a way. The humdrum sort adults practiced. Like he knows, like there's this other language that's happening. And it's not spoken mm -hmm. and it's happening at an adult level. And I can't, I just can't see it. It's alien to me. It's something I can't break through. So yep. yeah, it, again, this whole first section, just, I just, how well King nails this whole childhood piece and just how it all goes together. I just think it's great. And there's sort of like a, a fast forward reflective moment in here where uh, Bobby would later realize like the way that he always thought of his mother. It fast forwards to when he's an adult reflecting upon this time in mm. his life. And he says, uh, and the, the text is something along the lines of Bobby would later realize that he always imagined that his mother was in a shadowy, dark place, a place where he could not see her. So it's like she's behind a window, but far enough into the room where she's not visible. Yep. And he keeps picturing her nearby as like a, maybe a comfort, but never so close that she's actually with him and there's a distance at the same time and it doesn't get into it here in the text but it makes you wonder why would somebody simultaneously keep her nearby and put her at a distance and i think it's that 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 central conflict that he has with her he loves his mother but i don't know that he likes her yeah and he hasn't realized that yet um he's starting to pick up on the fact that maybe she's not a nice person mm. and he sees how poorly she treats other people 
and he doesn't like that about her. And it hasn't yet grown into an adult realization of like, yes, she's my mother. Yes, I love her. And she's not perfect. Right. So we mentioned before that Ted and Bobby had a discussion about Lord of the Flies. And this section is littered with the importance of books and reading and stories. And it all comes together. And it's almost as if it's a a major thesis for for this section of the book. And I thought it was interesting that there, if you've read any Stephen King, you realize that many, 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 many of his protagonists (laughs) are writers, right? And two or three, at least. Yeah, at least. Sometimes two or three in one book. Um, and often those are stand-ins for King in some way, right? Like, write what mm-hmm. you know and write a writer. And Bobby is a reader. Like, I think like that's one of the main character traits that you pull out of Bobby, that he's a reader. Even his mother realizes he's a reader and gives him a adult library card for his birthday. Um, and, I mean, you could see Bobby almost as a stand-in for a young King, who I would imagine was a in-depth reader of, of many, many things. And I think that that's sort of the stand-in for King here, is Bobby. They're of a very similar age, and uh, they like to read, and they have thoughts of potentially being a writer someday. Yeah, not every person who loves reading becomes a writer, but I think every person who writes fell in love with reading first. Yep. And that's what we're experiencing here through Bobby. So the main book, obviously, that we talk about is Lord of the Flies, but he drops hints of what I sort of think is a continuum of reading. So Bobby seemed to be a huge reader of Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys and Don Winslow of the Navy, what I would consider children's book. And he is starting to get into these, what I'm calling in-between books. So Case of the Velvet Claws, which is a Perry Mason book, which when Ted sees it, he sort of glances at it and puts it to the side. Mm -hmm. And then Ring Around the Sun by Clifford Simak. And then Isaac Asimov. Ted pulls over the the Ring Around the Sun book, which we're familiar with because King actually had mentioned it at the end of The Gunslinger, the afterward, I believe. Yes. So it is the book that says that there are multiple dimensions and that there are different Earths and there are many other worlds than these, basically, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's pretty much King's multiverse, multi-Earth theory, you know, in a slightly different form. And... The ring around the sun of the title is all of the different versions of Earth copied over and all in orbit around the one sun. Yep. And uh, yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's almost too on the nose for, <laughs> for, you know, the Dark Tower connection there. But King got his inspiration from somewhere. And why not bring it right into this story? Yep. And then, of course, there are the adult books, which even Bobby's not quite ready for, even though he has an adult library card. His mother says, I better not catch you reading Peyton Place or King's Row, because if I do, uh, the librarian will tell me and I'll know about it. So don't try, don't push your luck. Stay where, stay where you need to be. I realize that you're an advanced reader and you don't need to be in the children's section anymore, but don't go up into the smut that is Peyton Place, which uh-huh. Peyton Place, uh, an inspiration for Stephen King's Salem's Lot, ironically enough. He wanted to do a soap opera type thing, except with vampires. So I guess he had never heard of Dark Shadows. <laughs> uh, so. I mean, it's one thing to just sort of drop books in here and say, hey, look, here's all the stuff that was an influence for me when I was a child, or here's some books that I'm interested in, or here's things I've read. Um, King's done that elsewhere, but I think there's a reason for it here. And part of it is, I think King sees this tying back to our discussion of childhood as part of growing up. Mm -hmm. Because there's this continuum of books and the fact that he's interested in this, I think Bobby is learning how to grow up, and he's doing it through these books. And as a result of these books, and again, with a little bit of help and direction from Ted, he's becoming more contemplative about life and books and how that all fits together. And it, I mean, you could make the case that potentially it's, you know, someone like myself from a liberal arts background, I've made this case many times, it makes you a better person to have that sort of broader knowledge and ideas about the world, and especially if you're reading experiences other than your own. It opens you up to new ideas. Right. If you read fiction, you can live a thousand lives through those pages. If you don't read fiction, then you're only experiencing your own life. And that might not be a bad thing, but it's less life, right? It's less experience. And it's not the same as doing it yourself necessarily, but there are things in stories that maybe are impossible. You know, 
going off into distant parts of the universe or um, having stories that have completely fantastical things like dragons in them, what have you. But the central core of those stories are still about human emotions and conflict and drama and experiencing good works of fiction can really uh, elevate your own life and just giving you something to reflect back on. Just mm. have something to say, all right, that's what it's like in this story. How does that compare to my own life? Are there things there that I might aspire to or some new idea that never would have occurred to me otherwise that can fundamentally change my viewpoint on the world? I know that's happened for me in many books I've read throughout my life. And it's one of the reasons why I think reading is so important and one of the reasons why I keep doing it. Some might say reading is fundamental. Some might. <laughs> Some. Take a look. It's in a book. A reading rainbow. So along those lines, King is explaining his rationale for reading, I think, throughout this section. There are any number of quotes that you could pull from this that speaks to that. And I don't think it's just King doing everything that we talked about. I, I think it's a lot of that. But I think he's almost also pointing out in responding to his critics in some way and saying, hey, I'm not just writing schlock. I'm writing good stuff and it's important. And here's why it's important. Yeah. I think that King is ultimately leading us towards his central thesis of this story, if not this entire book, when he has Ted say to Bobby that there are also books of great writing that don't have very good stories. Read sometimes for the story, Bobby. Don't be like the book snobs who won't do that. Read sometimes for the words, the language. Don't be like the play it safers that won't do that. But when you find a book that has both good story and good words, treasure that book. I think this is one of the most important things King has written in one of his fiction stories. Yep. Um, that when you find that confluence, when you find that book that has both of those traits, that's really something special. And I think King is aspiring to fulfill that in this book himself. And I think he comes, you know, pretty close to hitting that mark. Um, I think that, as you said right at the top of the show, this is really, really good writing. And I also think this is a really great story. So there you go. You've got both of the things that Ted is saying. You need to keep an eye out for books that meet both of those criteria. Yep. And this is how Bobby's growing, right? Mm -hmm. Because Bobby initially thinks his view about reading for pleasure, however, was that such stories should be easy, that the writer should do everything except move your eyes back and forth for you. If not, how much pleasure could there be in it? You know, yeah. it's like he wants to be literally a passive reader. Mm -hmm. He wants to just sit there and have the book be read for him almost. Like you could almost see him just sort of like, yeah, I'm just going to sit here like Malcolm McDowell in A Clockwork Orange with my eyes poked open and you just sort of move my eyes for me and I'll read the book and I'll take pleasure in that. And it, it'll be like a drug almost. And that's what those, to some extent, children's books are. But Ted is encouraging him, much as he is with, the, with his mother too, to think more, right? Mm -hmm. Much as he is with the end of Lord of the Flies. Really? What? what why? Why would the author say that Maybe the crew is the one that needed saving, not the boys. Why is that? And think about it. Um, and it's also why he encourages Bobby to not judge a book by its cover. Like, he, he sees Lord of the Flies, and the cover confuses him because it's a very striking cover with the, the, the image in the corner. It's a lot of white space. And he immediately wants to yeah, flip striking over. Striking in how little information is there. Yeah. And he immediately flips the cover because he wants to read the blurb on the back. And, and Ted's like, nope. Come to the book as you would come to an unexplored land. Come without a map. Explore it and draw your own map, which again, fantastic, right? Like, yeah, just, and I think, again, great advice, great advice for becoming a better reader, but also, hey, critics, don't just judge this book because it has Stephen King and big letters on the cover and because there's, you know, a monkey with a symbol or a, you know, bloody it and a clown or a balloon, like come to it and try to get something out of it. Yeah. I've enjoyed lots of things, whether it's a, a movie or a book or what have you, that, where I have a really good idea of what's going to happen in the story and enjoyed them immensely. But I've also had wonderful experiences where I've just gone into something totally cold. And that experience of figuring out what's happening as it's happening is pretty special too. And that's what Ted's really talking about, right? It's beyond don't judge a book by its cover. It's 
don't even worry about what the book is about. <laughs> Let the book tell you what it's about by reading the book. I think that's great advice too. I mean, Ted's just full of gems. And then it comes to a head almost when he's in the Ferris wheel alone with Carol at the top of the mm -hmm. Ferris wheel. He hasn't thought any of that out about what he's going to do at the top of the Ferris wheel. He's not even sure if he likes Carol or what his feelings are for her, if she likes him. But in that moment, there's no map telling him what to do. He kisses her, and yeah. then he kisses her again, you know? And it's that whole sort of, hey, just, it's, it's unexplored. I mean, what you're describing about coming to a book cold is almost like a feeling of first love. You don't know what to expect. You don't know what's there, but you really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, and it fills you with a, a, a special kind of feeling. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that people fall in love with books like they do with people. Yeah. And just like relationships with people, you don't know that they're going to be the person you fall in love with the first time you meet them. Right. You don't know what achievements they might make. You don't know how they might inspire you. You don't know how they might disappoint you. And a book can do all of those things too. And if you read the plot summary or somebody tells you how it ends and then you read it anyway, because you're like, that sounds like something I would like. Yeah. You're kind of hedging your bets a little bit because then if you avoid the thing because you don't think you'll like it because you already have that info, maybe you're, you're denying yourself a book that you would have really loved because there's something about it that connects with you that didn't connect with somebody else. Right. So kind of building on that idea of how a book could disappoint you in the same way that it could enlighten you or entertain you, Ted drops another wonderful analogy on us. And he says to Bobby, a book is like a pump. It gives nothing unless first you give to it. You do this because you expect to get back more than you give, eventually. And what he's saying to Bobby is, you have to be willing to invest in the book a little bit. You need to give some of yourself. You need to do a little bit of work. So if the first page doesn't immediately draw you in, you're expecting too much from the book. But he does say, eventually, you're going to quit working that pump if no water comes out, right? So treat the book the same way. If the book still doesn't work for you after a certain amount of pages, then don't keep reading. Like, there's no reason to torture yourself with it unless it's an assignment for school or something, right? right? So if you're reading for pleasure and it's not giving you pleasure, stop. Go on to another book that will. And I love this advice. Yes. And as a pair of podcasters who are now on episode 58 of a series about, of books, I like this other gem from Ted. Good books are for consideration after, too. And good books don't give up all their secrets at once. Man, that should be our tagline for the series. Yeah. <laughs> And it's more than just the effect of the book itself, the experience of the, the content of the book. It's the experience of reading itself. King is celebrating this throughout the story. He's celebrating not just how good Lord of the Flies is, but how wonderful it is to just fall into a book the way that Bobby does, seemingly for the very first time. He's enjoyed lots of books, but I don't think he's been drawn into a book in the way that he has with Lord of the Flies before. And we get this beautiful scene where Bobby is sitting in the park reading the book, and he looks up from finishing the book, and he notices that he's covered in apple blossoms. And this paints this wonderful, beautiful picture, and it's just an extra layer of beauty on top of the simple joy of getting lost in a good book. Mm. We didn't need the apple blossoms. We, we understand what Bobby is, is experiencing here. And it's, it's such a treasure to, to get into that mode, get into that zone with a book that you love that much. But the fact that he didn't even notice all of this natural beauty around him because he was so absorbed in the book. And then when he looks up from the book and engages the world around him in that first moment, and it's covered in this beautiful drift of flower petals, it's just King knocking it out of the park one more time. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Yes, very nice. Very nice. Jay, we're going to introduce a new section with this episode that we're going to call Dark Tower Thinnies. Dark Tower Thinnies. Tell me more, Sean. What are Dark Tower Thinnies? Well, we've been talking about the Dark Tower for many, many episodes now. And now we're doing books that are somewhat related to the Dark Tower, almost as if there is a, a 
something in between the Dark Tower proper and these additional stories where reality is breaking through almost like a thinny in the Dark Tower where we can see almost the connections that are being made between this story and other stories in the Dark Tower proper. So this will be the section in which we try to pull out these these connections and see where there's crossover between these stories and the Dark Tower itself. So where the world of this book and the world of the Dark Tower have rubbed against each other enough that there is a thin passage between them. That's a much better way of putting it than how I did, yes. I should have had you introduce the section. <laughs> so we have said that this book comes between book four and book five in chronological order of the writing by Stephen King. And so that means, even though you and I have already been introduced to Ted Brodigan in book seven of The Dark Tower, this is actually his first appearance. That's right. So we get to know Ted Brodigan here. And you and I did read this book like <laughs> back in 1999 when it was published. And I didn't know that he has these, you know, superpowers of telepathy. And I guess what, what are his powers? Like, would you call it telepathy? Uh, I mean, I, I think he he gives it a word or something here and there, but. So, yeah. So what are his powers? I mean, he seems to be able to read minds, right? And also there is a point when Bobby is thinking something and he is able to answer Bobby's thought question out loud. So he's able to read his mind, but he also has an ability to psychically sense things because he has a sense of where the low men are and whether, which way they're heading. He says they they head west and they draw west they draw west so he has some idea of that so there's those powers when we get to the the dark tower books he seems to amplify the other breakers correct like right seems he to has be his... the ability to to be a uh, one of the most powerful breakers and he makes the other breakers even more powerful than they they would be without his assistance yep so yeah he's kind of a an amplifier as you put it and because Ted's touch seems to like transfer a bit of his own powers to Bobby for at least a period of time. We don't know if it's permanent or, or not yet. Um, I guess that's part of his power that he uses as a breaker, or he can help other breakers be more powerful breakers. Maybe he can amplify a normal person's ability to have some ability to read minds. Yeah, I couldn't. So I wasn't able to tell and whether more will be revealed or not, whether Bobby's, again, Bobby seems to have some low-grade telepathy. He's able to win a three-card Monty. Uh, he just has a winkle, is what they, he calls it, right? But that seems to be a direct result of Ted's uh, transfer of power. Yeah, I wasn't sure if I got that. Like, I didn't know if that was because that directly because of Ted or if it was because he has his own latent powers that maybe are are brought to the forefront or not. Because then he's also able to understand and see things that his mother has done. And I don't know, again, if that's all because of Ted or not. Um, but it, it is almost apparent, even from the very first scene of the book, when Bobby and his mother meet Ted for the first time, Bobby and his mother are walking opposite directions, and his mother has sort of chastised him and wants him to go to school. And he looks back, and his mother looks back at the same time, and he can know what she's thinking. And I don't know if that's already because he's been around Ted for even that short period of time, or if he just knows his mother that well. So I almost think it's a little bit left to be determined whether or not Bobby has any of his own psychic powers. Hmm. But I'm willing to not die on that hill if you believe that his only power is brought on by Ted. And I will, I will go with that until I read otherwise. So we're introduced to Ted. And I guess I, you and I haven't talked about this, Jay, but did you know going into this story that this was a Dark Tower related story when you first read it back in 1999? I don't think so. I don't, it was not advertised that way. Right. Did you make any sort of connection or did you just read the book and enjoy it and not until after you got into the rest of the Dark Tower books that you're like, oh, Ted brought again. I remember, I remember him. By the time I read book seven, The Dark Tower, I clearly remembered Ted Brodigan, but at the time I was reading this book was before I was ever purposely seeking out any connections to any other King books. So in terms of that, like I, I didn't even have that mindset to even think like, is this or isn't this a Dark Tower story? Is What are the connections? Should I be looking out for this stuff? And 
King was inventing these things out of whole cloth at this point. The character of Ted Brodigan himself, brand new person in the, the universe, uh, his psychic powers, um, they're being defined slowly over the course of the story. The idea that he's a breaker and that there are things, that there's something called the beam. We know about this from the Dark Tower, and only there does it become like very, very clear. So not only is Ted introduced in this book, but also the low men themselves, and really all of the things that you and I pointed out of what we liked about the low men, sort of that those missing pet posters and how they were chasing mm -hmm. after Callahan, like we thought that that was pretty brilliant. And here it turns out it was introduced in this book, not in book five. Um, and then it sort of added on. So Ted gives a whole pretty, a, a host of things for Bobby to look out for chalk symbols, especially if they're near hopscotch patterns that children might've written, um, loud, obnoxious cars and clothes that that really stand out bells that toll at the wrong time. So these are all hints that low men might be nearby or on their way. And Ted seems to think that children might notice this more than adults, that these things would just sort of be in the periphery of an adult's vision and that they wouldn't be able to focus on it, which, again, sort of tracks back to that, how children are different than adults and how they have a different viewpoint of the world than adults might. Right. The adults have conditioned themselves to ignore the things that they that, that don't make sense to them to the extent that they can almost convince themselves that it's not fair. So this loud, obnoxious car with the crazy paint job driven by somebody in a really obnoxiously colored suit with a yellow overcoat on is it's going to go unnoticed, even though that seems impossible, right? Like that would make them more noticeable. It would <laughs> right. make them stand out like, oh man, this garish car driven by people dressed in garish clothes. and um. And and I think King's psychology on that is is somewhat accurate. I I think that the more the more of a, a an adult perspective you have on the world, I think the less likely you are to pay attention to right. the low men. And for that reason, they can just slide right under the radar and keep doing what they're doing. Yes. Yeah, so lots of thinnies here. Um, another one that you pointed out to me that I didn't get is that Bobby is the same age as Jake, and then you reminded me that. When Ted appears in book seven, he mistakes Jake for Bobby, right? Yes. Um, they bear such a resemblance to each other. They don't look identical. They even have different hair color, but they're both the same age. They're a similar appearance. And to the point where Ted, who is not like, you know, a confused person or a, you know, easily fooled, he makes this mistake. So there must be a really strong resemblance between the two. Clearly, there's some twinner type of stuff going on here. I don't know if we're supposed to believe that Bobby and Jake have that much in common in terms of, is one just an alternate version of the other from a different version of Earth? I don't know if that's the case here, but they do share a lot of similarities. You know, and also Jake has the touch. And one of your theories is that maybe Bobby does too. We don't know if that's the case, but that could also be part of it. It's that maybe that's what confused Ted more than anything else, because he has this telekinetic or psychic power, and maybe that's how he's reading people first um, as he's meeting them. And he, when he met Jake, he's like, "Oh wow, strong in the touch." Uh, <laughs> you and and you're you vaguely resemble another eleven year old boy I used to know. I mean, if that's the case, it would make sense because in Roland's world, Ka would bring them together. So perhaps Ka is brought Ted to this specific house where Bobby is. Another Dark Tower thinny <laughs> is the uh, multiple occurrences of the song Twilight Time by the Platters. Mm. Um, as you may recall, we talked about how in book two of the Dark Tower, when Eddie and Susanna are first falling in love and have sex for the first time on the beach, Susanna thinks of this song. It's, it's almost like it's the soundtrack to that scene, and it's an important song to her. And it's a very important song to this story. Also, the name of the song is Bobby's favorite time of the evening. Mm. So the title has an importance, or the title has significance here. The song is heard multiple times in the background. And one of the sections of Hearts in Atlantis is called Heavenly Shades of Night Are Falling, uh, which is the first line of the song, I think. So 
clearly this is something that King was thinking about when he wrote this story. And definitely a direct connection back to the Dark Tower. Absolutely. Very good. Well, we will keep this section in because I think it will continue to illuminate some of these stories um, as we move forward. Hopefully you guys are not plugging your ears with Roland's bullets when we're talking about the thinnies. (laughs) I see what you did there. But we would be remiss if we just took away our favorite section, which is fun stuff, and replace it with another one. So we will continue to do fun stuff, and we'll start right now. What do you got, Jay? Well, as we've mentioned a couple times, this story has some fantastic writing in it. So I'll start off with another great line that we haven't covered yet. And that's when Ted quotes Ben Johnson when he says, Time was an old bald cheater. And Bobby is just blown away by this statement. He, he's delighted by the fact that he could sense that the word or phrase was exactly right, even though he couldn't say exactly why. And then made the further realization that that's why it's such a great line. <laughs> that it is more than the sum of its parts. It's more than just the words that make it up. It brings a totally perfect picture to your mind and you can't quite explain why but it's the picture that is important i also like the fact that this was a line that came up over and over again in star trek generations <laughs> <laughs> so i was it's already familiar with it here and then when it was in star trek it was great to hear it again as well <laughs> captain picard's always pulling out these types of lines so well some might say captain picard is an old bald cheater <laughs> some might <laughs> uh so i don't think there's anything to this but it has to be pointed out bobby's dad's name is randall garfield mm-hmm. and i know it's not rf but it's randall and you can spell flag out of garfield granted it's missing the additional g i mean you could even make an acronym and say randall flag ride or ride randall flag or dire randall flag or is that like a a dire wolf is like the bigger, badder version of a wolf. Yeah. So it's just a dire Randall flag is the bigger, badder version of Randall flag. And I can't think that there's anything to this, but it's just, I mean, maybe we have to see if the story goes anywhere, but is there any chance at all that Randall flag is Bobby's dead dad? Anything's possible, but why would King do that? He could have, he didn't need to name him Randall anything. Like he, it could have just been Joe Garfield, right? Like, right. Instead it's Randall. Yep. And Garfield, where you can put F-L-A-G and get flag. Yeah, it's it's suspicious. So I just wanted to point that out. It is fun stuff, after all. That's right. There was a, another great line about Ted's bags, about how they all looked as if they had been kicked here from California by someone in a bad mood. <laughs> that is good. Love it. The bad mood part is uh, what really makes it great. While we're briefly talking about Ted's bags, which are filled with books, and that's what makes Bobby's mom suspicious of him. Why does he have all these books? And why is the only thing he's carrying is books? Um, It is odd, but I, you know, to King's importance, I think King would say like, hey, if I only had three bags to take with me, maybe they'd be bags full of books. Yeah, I did wonder that, you know, if I were a guy on the run like Ted, and I needed to stay mobile, and I didn't have a lot of luggage... I I don't think I would have a lot of books as much as I love books. Like why even have the books? Like let alone move them around, but just, you know, you get a Kindle, Ted, you read a book, you put it down, you know, you're on the road, right? So we've talked before Bobby's kiss and King says it was the kiss by which all the others of his life would be judged and found wanting. Yeah. And perhaps this put me in the mood of princess bride when william goldman says since the invention of the kiss there have been five kisses that were rated the most passionate the most pure this one left them all behind and just to make all the connections clear william goldman author of the princess bride also screenwriter of misery i believe yeah i think that's right and princess bride was a rob reiner book a rob reiner movie that is also correct was it a castle rock production i would imagine so Hmm. Wow, see? Everything ends up in Castle Rock eventually. Yes. Um, We learned that Sully John's favorite word at the time was bastard, and Bobby's was rip shit. Mm. I like rip shit. Rip shit's pretty good. I like motherfucker more, (laughs) but rip shit's a pretty good contender for a favorite word. Bastard was my favorite word for a part of my life. (laughs) 
unfortunately i don't think i was 11 i think i was like 20 something but <laughs> i'm with you silly john uh and i also really love king's description of ted's brand new house keys because they had just been created the copies i guess had just been cut mm. and they were the color of bandit gold just really like that and yeah. i mean there's just so many layers in that you get a really great picture of what the keys look like and the color that they have obviously but they're not just like a golden hue or a, a brass color they're bandit gold <laughs> so it just it just infuses ted with so much more of like this man on the run this mm. this there's something about him that's not quite on the level and it's even there reflected in the color of his keys so um another fun stuff item is that uh king mentions the library police again here <laughs> he really seems to like this notion of the library police because king has ted say that if there were library policemen, they'd probably be after me. Yep. And King has, of course, written a whole short story about the library policemen and how they're in that story, there are people who do come after you and treat you quite poorly if you have overdue library books. But this has come up in numerous other stories that King has written. Well, you could probably figure if you're an 11-year-old poor boy who loves reading and gets all his books from the library, that might be your greatest fear is a library policeman. Mm -hmm. Especially when your mother has said, and written on the back of the adult library card you have, Bobby will responsible for all finds himself. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the interesting thing about this now is that my wife, who is a librarian, has said that many librarians are going away from doing fines because they find it too punitive. So they are no longer assessing fines as much as they used to. So less of a fear nowadays. And if you haven't already seen it, check out Weird Al Yankovic's UHF, and you get a little snippet of... Conan the Librarian. <laughs> That's right. He lives right next door to Spatula City. Spatula City. All right. Well, that was a very full episode of Two Guys to the Dark Tower Came. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Links to all of our contact information is available in the show notes. You can email us at twoguysdarktower at gmail.com. And our Twitter handle is at twoguysdarktower. You can also find us on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash twoguysdarktower or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash group slash two guys dark tower. If you like the show, please rate us on iTunes. Next episode, join us as we cover parts five through eight of low men in yellow coats found in hearts in Atlantis. For Jay Russo, I'm Sean McGurr. Thanks for listening. All right, I'm talking again. I can be silent no longer. Golden gem of wisdom. Golden gem? Make any <laughs> sense? <laughs>